for Sergeant Cap with Company D, Sinking United States Sharpshooters. Thanks for joining us in the workshop. Today we are talking dovetails and how to make the most hardcore Civil War ammunition boxes in the hobby. Now this isn't going to be sort of my typical super in-depth how-to video. This is going to be demystifying dovetails and showing you sort of like the low barrier uh, entry-level way that you can get into cutting your own dovetails without years of experience and in investing hundreds of dollars in, in antique or um, high-end traditional woodworking tools. Um, I'm also going to have uh, resources and documentation and great video links done by the masters of the craft down below for you to learn more about the specific details um, that I'm going to gloss over. So if this is something that really applies to you and really speaks to you, then you can check down below. Um, I'm really passionate about uh, historical accuracy in woodworking. Um, to the same degree, I think many hardcores are obsessed with their uniforms. Um, but And I, I feel that woodworking items get short shrift and there's not a lot out there. So if you want something um, truly accurate and well made, you often need to make it yourself. And at Company D, we want to make sure that information and that research and those ideas are available to you and to the hobby at large. So um, today is a uh, regulation modification of our previous uh, how to make a Civil War ammunition box video, which will be up here somewhere. Now, uh, in Hamler's plan that we followed, he used box joints, period correct. Um, and you also see a lot of people, uh, a lot of sutlers selling uh, butt jointed ammunition boxes. Those did exist and they did exist on both sides. Um, the problem is, their butt joinery is, that's just when you, you know, put two boards together like that. Um, the problem is with that is, I mean, the reason I think you see a lot of it is because it's, it's cheaper to make, um, which means there's a chance for more profit in it. Um, but there's not a whole lot of pride that goes into um, this sort of uh, item when it comes to, to purchase. There's not a lot of thought in, in wood selection and wood grain uh, fit or finish and, or any of that. And that's kind of a shame because these needed to be well constructed because the, the ammunition needed to be protected um, from the elements and protected during transportation. Uh, if you have a shoddily made ammunition box, then water and moisture can get inside, the ammunition could be damaged, and that could cost soldiers their lives. Um, again, you know, his, you know, historical woodworking nerds like myself, we're going to notice that sort of thing. Uh, most people aren't. Um, the one thing that I guess is going to be far be still about this project is that we're using three quarter inch uh, boards that you can get from any box store. The, the dimensions of the boards were different and you can find those in period sources. Um, they would have been slightly thicker and, and it changed also too if like you're uh, making like a, a box for artillery for example. Those will definitely even be thicker than a cartridge box. The but the thing about um, still hardcoring three quarter inch ammo boxes is because anyone can cut a dovetail and I'm gonna show you how you can go about it affordably, but not everyone has access to a thickness planer um, or the time or the investment to do it traditionally with like scrub, like, you know, scrub plane, jack plane, um, smoothing plane, you know, winding sticks and panel gauges. There's a, there's a lot of knowledge and practice that goes into um, hand thicknessing, say like a, a two by eight down to one inch uh, or five eighths, for example. Um, and most people aren't going to notice this, uh, especially when the box is closed. Pe only people like me are gonna be able to, from a distance, recognize that that board is a quarter of an inch too thin for that item. So this is sort of our balance. But I want to get more into the weeds about historical woodworking and the nuances and things to look for at the end of the video. And I want to get straight into the business of cutting dovetails right away. So um, on this one, you can see what I've done. I went ahead and got started on one of the ends. And you can see the dovetails. And we're going to do this side together. 
And you can see I already have everything laid out with my marking line. And we'll get to that later. So what's my documentation? So for those of you reading along at home, I am using the uh, third edition 1862 ordinance manual. And on page 269, it states that packing boxes are made of white pine boards dovetailed and nailed together and are finished with wooden brackets or handles nailed to the ends with wrought nails clenched to the inside the lids fastened with six inch and three quarter screws. They are painted different colors to indicate the kind of cartridges. The boxes should be lined with strong paper and the bundles of cartridges must be packed closely so as not to shake in transportation. Each box should be marked on each end with the number and kind of cartridges and on the inside of the cover with the place and date of fabrication. Um, now, there are some really big things left out of that regulation. So from a historical woodworking standpoint, it says they need to be dovetailed, right? Which, and dovetails are super underrepresented. They don't tell you how many. And for someone like me, that's a big deal. Uh, now, the other nerdy thing that they leave out is they don't suggest a dovetail angle. So... Um, these little pieces right here, we're going to cut, cut these out eventually, but, and these are the tails. The dovetail angle is the steepness of the tail. So this angle right here. And if you're doing a historical reproduction and trying to go for like real accuracy, this geometry matters. And unfortunately, there are not many images of dovetail ammunition boxes. Um, we know there were probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of them made. Um, but as far as like high quality, uh, high resolution images of originals, there's very few. And so I'm, the ones that I have seen have shown four tails on the ends of the box. And so that's what I'm going to uh, do today. Uh, I think it's interesting that the government didn't specify how many tails. Um, but I'm going to run with four because I've seen three period originals that have these. Unfortunately, they're just pictures, so I can't um, do any more research on this, and we'll talk about that later. So um, let's get into some tools. Now, like I said, we're just doing three quarters. So just go to your box store, get cutting like in our uh, ammunition box video. Um, the first thing I want to recommend to you, and none of this is sponsored, but I have worked with this stuff. I'm very happy with it. And there are a lot of different alternatives too that might work for you. But I highly recommend the Cats Moses Dovetail Jig. I think I paid 30 or $35 for this. Um, uh, Jonathan J. Cats Moses did a great video on this whole system on um, uh, when he visited uh, David Picciuto on uh, Make Something. And I'll have that link down there for you to watch this thing in use and the tools and the way that he does it. It's great. And so what's nice about these is it's all laid out and it has magnets. So you don't have to have really any hand tool, hand saw skills. Um, this is, and you can buy it in, in angles, in the, like your dovetail um, angles. So I have a, a one in six and it has magnets, so so here's like your dovetail angle. Uh, you put this on your line where you want your tail to start, and then it'll stick to your saw, and it will hold your saw to that precise angle until you hit your baseline. It also has a 90, and it has all the layout angles for cutting your pins too. So aside from having to do a little bit of layout, this is all you need. And then you're going to need um, a saw. So I'm going to show you what I use, and I'm going to tell you how you can get on, in on this on the cheap. So um, I use a Lee Nielsen um, uh, dovetail saw. This is crazy expensive, and but I do a lot of this. So um, for those of you who may be more familiar with tools, this is like, like the snap-on of traditional woodworking tools. Um, and works great, but this... This is a rip cut because it's a dovetail, so it goes down the grain. And then I have a Veritas uh, rip uh, cross cut saw. 
So this is like way over a hundred bucks. This is like, I think 60 or $70. And I, I love this saw too. Um, so if you wanted something more about a Western traditional style and kind of get like a step up from sort of the bottom that I'm gonna recommend, uh, check out some Veritas saws. They're, they're really nice and I'm very happy with them. Um, but what uh, Katz Moses recommends is you just go on like Amazon and get like a $20 Japanese uh, pull saw. And you can do all of this and it'll, um, it'll cross cut and rip um, just fine. And you'll get good quality dovetails every time. Uh, so there's what 30 35 plus 20 bucks. That's those are the two main things you need is a saw and a dovetail jig um, Then you're also going to need some chisels uh, to clean out your waist depending if you if you're well You're always going to need a chisel. Um, I get I got these ones years ago. I forget like Lowe's or Home Depot They're really affordable and I have absolutely loved them. Um, I've spent a lot of time sharpening and dialing them in but these things I, I love these things. I wouldn't buy anything else. Um, and it, if you just need a couple of chisels, which is probably all you need, um, you can look at uh, flea markets and antique stores and spend a little bit of time taking the rust off, sharpening them up. There's some great videos on YouTube on how to sharpen chisels and you can get going for just a couple bucks there. Um, you're going to need some layout tools. Um, I use old timey dividers, but you can use these ones, this, these little kits that you get like craft stores and office stores, um, just to lay out your dovetails. I'm gonna have a video uh, in the description on how to lay out dovetails, that's really good. Layout can can be a little confusing at first, so just give yourself patience and then that light bulb's gonna go off and it's gonna seem like the simplest thing in the world, um, but it's gonna be like reading a foreign language for the first time, the first time you hear it. But then once you get it, this is pretty much all you need. And one thing I would highly recommend for that extra historical accuracy, not required, um, is a uh, cutting gauge. And this is how we lay out the depth of our tails and pins. So accuracy, so I don't know how thick this is, so I'm not going to you know, use one of these and measure it. I'm going to set this gauge to the thickness of this board and then I'm going to scratch it around the edges of the board and I know to stop cutting right on that line. And this also gives me a place to register my chisel as I start to clean out the very bottom of the waist of my tails and pins. Now, this line is really important in historical reproductions. Uh, modern uh, woodworkers, they super obsess and they're very deliberate about hiding um, the marking gauge lines. Um, in the 19th century, it wasn't a big deal. It's like, yeah, in um, high-end furniture pieces um, or uh, you know, really fancy projects, yeah, they would be deliberate and just only mark what they needed to mark. But in a lot of country furniture, um, and even like sort of like the secondary parts of the furniture, like the, the carcass construction, the back panels, you're, you're going to see these all over the place. And in every single um, photo of an original Civil War ammunition box, they had those lines. And I talked about these marking gauge lines in like my first woodworking video. Um, so this line matters because it's going to be subtle, but it will pop just a little bit once you get this thing painted. And then a nerd like me is going to be like, that's good job, you nailed it. Um, but you don't need one of these. You can get these in antique stores, um, eBay for usually oh, 10 or 20 bucks. Um, they usually get misidentified, so sometimes you can find them a lot cheaper. A lot of people today have no idea what these are. This was made by a uh, retired uh, woodworker in the town nearby, and I've used it ever since. Um, but if you just have like a like a little uh, combination square and cutting knife, uh, then you can, you can, so don't measure, you know, you don't really measure much in woodworking. You just, you set your combination square like you would the marking gauge, and then you would kind of follow your knife along the edge, and you'd still get that, that marking line for that historical hardcore touch. So you can already see there's a lot more as to make in, in making a hardcore Civil War woodworking item than just getting the dimensions right. Tool marks are really important. Um, 
And yeah, I think I think that's that's it. So let's go ahead and get set up. Now we have our two end pieces of our ammo box uh, clamped together and uh, fixed in our bench vise. Now I've already laid out my tail locations and I have a link down in the description on how to lay out your tails. I'm using four tails on this based on my research and each one of your boards is going to be different. So it's, that's why you get such incredible precision from uh, dividers because you know it's just it's the pin prick and it's not a pencil line and you'll see that in the video I have down below so here is sort of a snapshot maybe if you just want some help with a ballpark you can see in this um, that I am just a skosh over the required six and a quarter inches of width and that's so I can uh, true anything up with a hand plane at the end or remove any uh, bruising or other tool marks that I don't want on the piece. So I'll get this down when I'm done with it. Then, now you have all this laid out. It's important to always mark your waist, as you can see I've done here. So these are, this is our, our half pin on either end, and we have three full pins. And then when you cut, you always want to cut on the waist side of your line. Um, it doesn't make such a big deal um, when you're cutting your tails first um, because the side pieces get fitted to whatever you cut here. But still, it's, it's good practice to keep in mind. So mark all of that so you know which side to put your saw on. Then, um, all you have to do now is... Take your dovetail jig and make sure the angle is going in the direction that you want and line up your saw and you can get it started first if you want but I have my saw teeth on the waist side of my line and I just hold the jig and I just gently push my saw back and forth and this is going to keep my angle true and my cut across the top square, all of which are very important to have a nice, tight joint. And then earlier we made that gauge line, that's the depth of our tail. Blow the dust out of your way so you can see where you're cutting. Don't go past your line, you'll see it. And just like that, you have one side of your tail done. Now, you can see this, this jig only has one direction. So how do you cut the other side of the tail? Well, that's why I have my pieces clamped together, because then you just flip the work piece around, and you cut the other way. So same thing. Put the teeth on the waist side of the line, hold your jig firmly, and get cutting. Depending on your wood, sometimes it's it's good to oil your blade, and that runs nice and smooth. So you would just do that uh, for all your pins, and then we have to cut the half pin off. So to do that, I'll stick this in my vise, and this is an odd side for me because I'm right-handed, and so I'd have to cut with my left hand, but that's not a big deal because what you can do is just take. Hang on. Gotta grab my marking knife and my square, and we have our marking line. So I can register my knife into it, put my square up against it, and I'm just going to. Oop. Doesn't help my case if I uh, mess up my line, because then that's gonna be too deep. 
And then, especially if this is your first time, but even just good practice, because even the best woodworkers have an off day, um, you're going to get a little pile of sawdust on your workbench. Save it, and if you have any small gaps when you're done, just mix it with some glue and then pack it in, and it'll disappear once it's all painted. So now I have a deeper uh, uh, marking line right here, and then I'm going to take my chisel, and I'm going to give my saw a groove to follow. Remove that waste. See this practice in our other woodworking videos. Just like that. So even though this is on an angle and I don't want to unclamp everything, I have my dovetail jig. So if you're using a Japanese saw, um, like uh, Cats and Moses shows, um, you can just keep using the same saw. I have two saws, so I'm going to use them. So I'm going across the grain. So I'm using a crosscut saw. And I'm going to set my jig. So it's going to cut me a 90 degree cut. And that'll do it in any direction. So it's not that one, because that one's angled. And you just kind of turn your jig around. It's not that one. It's that one. So now I line this up. And I put my saw into my little knot and I, even though I'm cutting on, on an angle in my bench this is cutting a perfect 90 degree cut to my tail and just go easy don't overcut okay so I'm just about down there and I'm going to remove this a little bit of sawdust, just gently. All a saw wants to do is cut straight, and it's got a track to follow. Okay, I think I'm done. Now sometimes I'll get in here a little bit, because sometimes you'll get a, a hump in the middle of the piece. And you can see this one's already ready to come off. And then you would just go back, I'd, I'd use a slightly bigger chisel. Hold the chisel flat to the tail, and then just pare in and remove the saw waste. We have all the waste cut out from our dovetails that we started earlier. Uh, for this, I just used uh, a coping saw to take out uh, most of the waste here, and then I chopped down to the line with a chisel and a mallet. You'll see that in any number of YouTube videos that are in depth for cutting dovetails. Now we have to transfer our tails to our pin boards, which on this project is the front and back of the ammo box. So uh, you can see I went ahead and labeled all my pieces so that they match. And so I don't lose track of which tails and pins go together. And you just have to line up your boards nice and square and even to each other and then make sure I always um, set my marking gauge just a teeny bit over so I'm now I'm just checking to make sure that I'm all the way forward and then I have the tail board resting on just any plane to keep it flat I have my marking knife and then I'm going to very lightly at first trace out my tail if you go too hard the end grain will pull your knife all over the place and you, you'll just have a heck of a time trying to get an accurate mark. And then you just take your time and you trace all of your tails and then you'll be ready to start cutting. Now that our pin boards are marked, it's important to once again make sure that we mark our waist. So uh, it's always handy to keep your dovetail piece, your, your tail end next to it so you know that we have a tail here so we have to cut out this space, this space, this space, and that space. And then remember, when we get to cutting this, you need to cut on the waist side of these lines because if you go on the other side, then you're gonna have really loose joints and box will look bad and it won't function properly. 
So now that we have this set up, we grab our dovetail guide again, and then we turn it around until it matches the angle of the pin, and then making sure we're on the waist side of our knife mark. We set it up, hold it real nice and snug, and get to cut. And then when you're done with this, you'll flip the board around and cut the angle from the other direction. And then you just go back to chopping out everything like you did for the dovetails. I thought I'd go ahead and get you in close while I clean out my pin waste, just in case you were curious how I did it. So what I'm doing is I'm uh, just going in and uh, making my marking gauge lines a little more pronounced, just carefully tracing that, with, uh, cutting it in with my marking knife. And I'm doing that on both sides. And this just gives me the ability to put a uh, slightly, slightly deeper um, notch into the knife wall. So I have that um, deeper line and now I just go back in with my chisel and I just cut in to that knife wall to give my chisel a place to rest. And I'll do this on both sides of the, the boards, whether it's the tails or the pin boards. And this will give me a nice, clean, crisp uh, shoulder for the final final result. The, re the reveal is just as important as the, the joinery. There you go, for well under $100 worth of tools, uh, you now have the most hardcore ammunition box in the hobby with hand cut dovetails as requested by the ordinance manual. Um, this is really accessible, I encourage you to kind of get into it um, or at least just kind of experiment with it. I have links to some amazing videos and more in-depth how-tos down below for you to check out. Um, and so let's kind of go ahead and get into the weeds uh, a little bit more. Um, as far as finishing this, you just finish it just like the, our other ammunition box video. Um, but I want to get into the point that there's a lot more complexity with, uh, historical reproductions and building something like this than just knowing the dimensions, um, and understanding historical woodworking practices, and just kind of the way things age over time. Um, like I pointed out earlier, the ordinance department doesn't tell us how many dovetails um, these should have had. I saw a couple of four, I went with four. Um, I don't know, since I didn't, I couldn't have my hands on it and I couldn't put, you know, measuring instruments to it. Um, I don't know, I, I took a reasonable guess as far as the width of the pins based on the picture. Um, I think these are three eighths, um, but I also don't know how they were made. A lot of that gets lost to history. I have a sneaking suspicion that uh, after about a hundred of these, just about any carpenter would have the muscle memory to do this freehand, and you would have to measure all of these tail angles because we also don't know the dovetail angle on these. If they are one in five, one in six. Um, if they are free-handed, they may all be slightly different. Um, and, or if they use some sort of like layout um, jig, um, you could look on the end grain and if you could see like a, 
like a rogue pinprick that didn't get removed. Uh, that could be from uh, compasses when they were pacing out their tails. Um, but I, I, my hunch is that these were just at some point just cut freehand uh, because a, a skilled carpenter or a joiner uh, could do that with great efficacy. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is uh, people bring up paint in forums. And unless you follow the ordnance manual recipe and the methods of making it exactly, we'll never really know what these look like. Um, and you, you may say, oh, well, first sergeant, well, there's several in museums. I know where there's one right now. It's like, that, that's awesome. I am jealous because I'd love to see one of these up close. Um, but the paint that you're looking at today is nothing what it looked like 150, 160 years ago. Um, and there's two major culprits uh, for that, uh, oxidation and ultraviolet light. Um, you're gonna have um, light degradation happening over generations and you're gonna have various elements um, inside the paint and the wood that are going to oxidize uh, differently and cause colors to change. And uh, so boiled linseed oil, for example, is in almost every uh, oil-based paint recipe of the time. Um, and to give you an example of what boiled linseed oil does, this uh, uh, joiner plane, this wooden one right here, this is made in the 20th century, so it's maybe, oh, maybe 100 years old at the latest, maybe 70 to 80. Um, and you can tell even from this bad angle that it's it's a brown dark brown well um, and if you come across one in an antique store that's like super dark brown or black um, odds are that's probably like an English tool because English woodworkers um, instead of using boiled linseed oil tended to use something like tallow uh, but you'll even see that old far enough in the past depending on the region of the United States the use of tallow so boiled linseed oil there turns brown tallow will oxidize black and all of these planes are made out of a hardwood of either ash or beech. And that's the color of that plane when it was brand new. This is a off cut of some beech that I have in my shop. So yeah, these planes don't come new brown. They, they come almost white. And then age, oil, oxidation, um, hand oils, dirt, will all change the way that that um, plane looks over time. Um, and then on top of that, you have, you know, things in the paint like lead. Um, if you've, you know, if you've been around like original uh, tinware with lead solder, uh, one easy way to identify lead solder is that it turns black over the generations, so you know not to drink out of that sort of uh, tinware. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the best we can do is honest research, and um, fair compromises. Um, it's reasonable, you know, because it also has lamp black in the paint mixture that it would have been, a, you know, a mid to darker side of olive green. Um, but aside from being in a time machine um, or being a dangerously committed uh, reenactor, making it, making that paint in the original way with the methods and the chemicals, um, there's no way to know for sure with 100% certainty what that paint would have looked like because oxidation and UV light are gonna change it. Um, the other thing that is beyond measurements in paint is tool marks. And we kind of cover that with the marking gauge lines. Um, and even if you just butt joint stuff, then the gauge line is a good way to add some um, uh, authenticity. So maybe if you actually had to measure a part, um, you might have a, a gauge line. Um, as far as just you know, rough cutting on, on, a, on a butt joint doesn't make any sense. Uh, but maybe if you put hinges on it, you might have like a, a knife line or a marking gauge line. Something to show some, some accuracy uh, of traditional tools being represented on a piece. Um, a, a lot of people ask um, about sanding. I sand all my pieces um, unless I'm told not to because we all like sanded stuff. Um, but if someone really wants really like really high historical accuracy, um, what I'll do, and what I'm pretty sure they did, is probably just on the outside of the box, um, they would have taken a smoothing plane uh, to the outside and just probably gone over really quick uh, to take care of any 
uh, uneven joinery uh, or undulations in the surface. Um, this is a moderate, well, you know, post-war smoothing plane. Uh, the originals would have been wood. And um, what's unique about a smoothing plane is unlike a joiner plane, a joiner plane iron is typically uh, perfectly flat. Smoothing planes will have an ever so gentle camber or curve to the iron so that the, the corners of the iron don't dig into the piece as you're trying to smooth the surface. That's what I call a smoothing plane. And so um, what I would do is set this iron really shallow and just kiss the outside. And what that curved blade does is it leaves um, scall like a scalloped undulation on, on, the out on the surface of the wood. And sometimes you can feel it. And that is another hardcore detail that you'll never see in a forum, um, but you'll see it here. Um, so a tool mark like that in the finishing process could survive to this day. Um, the wood itself, modern wood, farb. Um, so if you're gonna make a hardcore box, you're compromising on the wood, unless you're um, using like reclaimed barn, barn wood or someone's remodeling uh, uh, an 1850s or 1860s farmhouse and you can mill and reclaim that wood, and build a box out of it. Because um, they were still cutting down old growth. So the, the grain pattern and the tightness, uh, all that is going to be um, emblematic or you know, an important part of that historical piece. And if you want to get like, just way down the, you know, way, way down the rabbit hole. So, period wood. So wood cut down during the Civil War to build this. That wood reflected the weather. So this weather that is being uh, reflected in this wood grain, it's far. <laughs> so, um, so trees tell more of a story. Lumber tells more of a story than just holding things together. Um, so there's a lot of details that go into um, just analyzing wood choice uh, in a historical piece. Um, and the milling process would have been different. Um, a finished piece is going to remove milling marks regardless if it was done, you know, at a modern living history farm on a, on a water uh, mill um, or if it's done uh, with modern tools and equipment. Um, it's all in the finishing that will generally remove all of that, but um, that's also something to consider. And <clears throat> all of that plays into making one prohibitively expensive ammunition box. Um, and I don't, I don't think most of us in the hobby are willing to pay the same amount of money for an ammunition box as we would um, a well-made, perfectly designed uh, period uniform. Um, I, I hope through videos like this and the education that we do here on our channel and on our website that we'll kind of start learning more about um, historical camp furniture and sort of the, the military accoutrements. like. Uh, ammo boxes and hardtack boxes that we start raising our standards, um, sharing that information, building our own stuff, and kind of expecting more uh, from sutlers or, or people trying to sell this stuff. And you may ask, like, well, why don't you know why don't people sell dovetailed ammo boxes? Well, these are cut by hand, and they take a lot longer. They require uh, more skill and practice to have a, a product uh, worthy of selling, in my opinion. And that costs more. And um, so, you know, something like this would probably be twice the cost of my standard um, box joint ammo box that we did the other video on. And it's because this requires a lot more skill and know how and more of my time. Um, the other thing that you see, you know, sort of like a downfall is a lot of woodworkers will make um, the butt joint ammo boxes because they're quick and dirty. You can turn a, a quick profit. Um, but and also to kind of keep that profit up, they don't spend a lot of time, um, they may not spend enough time going to the wood pile and picking the, the choicest boards with the straightest grain and the fewest knots. And if you're not thoughtful about your wood choice, that wood is going to react and cup and bow and twist and just completely blow any joints that you might have. You'll get gaps, um, it may flex a lot. Uh, it's not gonna be a really high quality piece. And so you have that knowledge that's important to making quality woodworking items. And so, yeah, I mean, this, this just takes humility and research and sharing that information uh, with other people. 
And um, even if you don't plan on making something like this, this is a good opportunity for you to spark your curiosity and do a little bit of research. Maybe watch some YouTube videos. Um, probably my, my number one source for how this stuff was originally made is check out Roy Underhill of the Woodwright Shop. The show's been on TV for like 40 years. I think PBS has like 17 seasons for free. And then I think Popular Woodworking bought the rights to all the early episodes. Uh, but you can watch those with a, a subscription. You can like get the subscription for a month, binge watch uh, all those episodes. And Roy, I mean, he starts from a tree and he makes furniture from it using all, all the original tools. And it doesn't take too many episodes for you to kind of get this wealth of understanding and familiarity with the names of tools. Um, so thanks for sticking along and um, let us know if you have any questions or comments down below. Thanks as always for liking, commenting, and subscribing. Um, be sure to click that notification bell down there uh, to stay updated on all of our future videos when they come out. And we'll see you next time.